Hello everyone, this is Dark Journalist. Tonight I have a very special part one interview with Oxford Scholar and the author of the Giza Death Star book series, Dr. Joseph Farrell. Tonight Dr. Farrell will go deep on the FBI raid of President Trump at his Florida Mar-a-Lago residence. The unexplained raid is an escalation by the deep state to remove a major political rival. But does the story go deeper still, involving the UFO file? Please join us now. Joseph, it's great to see you. Good to see you, Daniel. Uh, it's quite an interesting time for us to be speaking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yesterday, something uh, rather historic and momentous happened. It's just off the charts, and I've been doing reports on it since then, and the general reaction I'm getting is everyone is just flabbergasted. The FBI raided uh, President Trump in his Mar-a-Lago home looking for something. Mm -hmm. and um, we had 40 FBI agents and machine guns and all the rest of it. Um, Joseph, what's going on here, and does this sort of cross the Rubicon in terms <laughs> of political opposition and deep state activity? I've heard that phrase, crossing the Rubicon, so much since this thing began, and in fact, on my little set of printed notes here, I have crossing the Rubicon. <laughs> okay. Right at the top. <laughs> um I'm not flabbergasted. This is not the first time the federal government has exhibited its true nature. The first time being under Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, mm -hmm. when he locked up countless people for disagreeing with his narrative in the North. <laughs> okay. Right, right. You know, in the South, he was invading that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, this is not the first time. Uh -huh. We need to get over the idea that, that, that uh, we're the exception to the rule of history, that we're the exception to the way governments have always acted. We're not. Mm -hmm. We're not. It's here we go again. It's here we go again is what this is. Now, am I surprised that the FBI did this? No, because if you know anything about the FBI, this is one of the most corrupt agencies in this government and has been since its inception. Ask Martin Luther King. Ask all of the black civil rights uh, workers during the 1960s and 50s, for that matter, how they view FBI surveillance and harassment. This is not the first time. Right. Let's not forget the FBI spied on Marilyn Monroe and John Kennedy. You know, this. I am not surprised that this corrupt organization did this. What I am surprised at is that, yes, this is a crossing of the Rubicon moment for the simple reason that, number one, President Trump is a relatively powerful individual. He's rich. Uh, he has a, a base of following among the people that is in the several of millions, and they did this anyway. And that should tell everyone there's now a big target painted on you and on me. Mm -hmm. They won't hesitate to do this to anybody that, that they don't like. So like it or not, folks, the FBI just sig and this government just signaled to you that you're in it for your life. Mm -hmm. there, there's no two ways around this. Uh, that's what they just signaled. Now, here's the problem. If you look at what's done, they have just violated a precedent. They didn't even do this to Richard Nixon. Right. You know, and Nixon, whatever you think of or say about him, there was a lot more prima facie evidence that he had done something wrong than there is with Donald Trump. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, take that for whatever it's worth. So they've done this to Donald Trump. And I have to wonder if if we're looking at a bit of theater, and I, I'm going to be tossing out lots of, of uh, yes. off the end of the twig scenarios here. Please do, yeah. I, I can't make Heidner sense. In the bottom, the bottom line here, Dana, is I can't make sense of this. 
Yeah. The Democrats, if if they're the ones behind this, they just cut their own throat. Yeah. I mean, this makes no sense to me. Uh, even even if they're that desperate, they just cut their own throat. Uh, so I have to wonder, is this a play, is this a ploy to get them to establish a precedent? Which, if the Republicans do manage to uh, pull off this election, in other words, if the Democrats don't resort again to massive election fraud, uh, that put this current illegitimate president, grifter, corrupt criminal, demented, senile old man in the White House, and I'm being generous and kind. <laughs> um, if they don't pull off another stolen election, um, then this is going to allow the Republicans to break precedent and go after that party in a major way, and it needs to be done. Hillary needs to be in jail. Bill Clinton needs to be in jail. Chuck Schumer needs to be in jail. All of them need to be in jail. Yeah. Um, what this just did is it solidifies Trump's base. And it also does something very convenient for Trump. It takes Ron DeSantis out of play. Yeah. Now, between the two of them, I'm a much bigger Ron DeSantis fan because he actually takes action. Mm -hmm. He doesn't talk a big talk. He actually takes action. And it's very clear where he stands on the basis of the actions he's taken. That's the other nice thing about it. Um, it puts Trump into the position. And, and I suspect that, that the thing that they're worried about now is that Trump signed that Schedule F executive order. A friend of mine reminded me about this. And that basically puts the entire federal bureaucracy in play, that he can go in there and clean him out. And now he's got, now he's got the, uh, not just the authority, but he has the moral base to go in and, and do that. Right. Um, he's, he's got the support in other words to do that. So that's my first scenario. Was this something that was allowed to happen and the Democrats were sucker punched because they have crossed the Rubicon here. All gloves are off from this point on out in American uh, politics. There's no more bipartisanship in in the sense of the old days that you and I grew up. That's gone. Mm -hmm. That is now gone. This is going to be an oppositional system from here on out until it collapses, which probably isn't far off. <laughs> right. um, now, here's my next question. Did, did uh, the alleged president know? Did Mr. Biden and co. know? Um, if he did, he's probably already forgotten. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. I mean, what difference? I was does thinking it make? he planned it, but yeah. Well, yeah. What difference does it make if he knew or he didn't know, or yeah. if he planned it or didn't plan it? Because the guy is a blithering idiot, and you know it doesn't matter. So, in other words, the way I'm looking at it is that whoever planned this, it's whoever is running this misadministration. It's not coming out of the Oval Office. This is all part of the holographic administration that it's been since since he won the election. <laughs> okay. right. Which wasn't fraudulent at all. Right. But <laughs> perfectly legitimate. It was perfectly legitimate. And those who think that oh my statistics doesn't work this way, well they're just conspiracy theorists. But right. anyway. let's send their names to Merrick Garland, right? Yeah, now. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so uh I, I'm viewing it as a bit of deep state uh politics, but again if our deep state is this colossally stupid, then there's something wrong. In other words, I'm having difficulty trying to trying to rationalize what we just saw. It doesn't make sense to me that they'd pull something that is this big of a clunker. Even Joe Biden. Yeah. <laughs> even even if he is demented, you know, <laughs> right. and he is, <laughs> but it, it doesn't make sense. To I know me. this All is right. beyond like Comey and Strzok and everything. This is one of the worst things I've ever oh, seen. Oh, it's absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, if I were the governor of Florida, well, we'll get back to that. All right. So then we learn that a former lawyer for Jeffrey Epstein is the magistrate that took out the search warrant. Right. Okay. Now, wait a minute here. 
why didn't the FBI go to somebody a little higher up in the chain of command other than Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer? So that smacks to me of, of some sort of pressure being applied to on a judge to get a warrant that no straight-thinking, straight-shooting judge would ever allow. So exactly. in other words, they used this guy because they had some sort of leverage on him. Um, so is this some sort of payback against President Trump for his executive orders about child sex trafficking and, and all of that stuff? I don't know, but it could be. And it happens when we're beginning to hear allegations coming out of the Ukraine that they have been that that so-called government has been involved in uh, human trafficking and sex rings, you know, the whole nine yards. I have no yeah. doubt. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, we're we're dealing with the Biden family here. Yeah, uh, you know, and and they are as corrupt and criminal as can be. So, is there something relating here to the Ukraine and to the sex uh, trafficking, you know, network scandals? I suspect there may be. All right, then we don't really know as yet what was on that search warrant. Right. You know, when you swear out a search warrant, you have to say, well, we're looking for this and such and such. You have to spell out. There has to be probable cause for the government to get a warrant to go in and search somebody's property. And uh, to me, it's very telling that we don't know what they were looking for. They apparently chose a time when they knew President Trump and his staff and his family were not going to be at Mar-a-Lago. And then they they apparently have been there searching for over nine hours. Amazing. Now, to me, that's a fishing expedition. That's not a search. Right. That's that's a fishing expedition. So that makes that that to my mind makes this even worse of a flaunting of law and justice, which it is. That's there's no two ways about that. Um. So I I'm wondering if if anything at this point that the federal government might claim that they found is simply manufactured evidence. We're dealing in the age of deep fakes, and it would not surprise me a bit. I, at this point, anything that the FBI, the federal government, be, be they rhinos or Democrats or, or part of the Biden administration or Congress, anything they say, I am absolutely 100% skeptical of. They have lost me. Yeah. I pay my taxes now because I'm forced to, not because I enjoy it. They they are out of control. They are not to be trusted in anything, they say. And this goes double for the Democrats, absolutely double. Now, here's the problem. If... If the if the goal of this whole operation was to take out Trump, this is why I question that this is the motivation for it. Because what it's done is it's made him much more uh, palatable as a candidate than oh, yeah. before. It has removed his principal opposition or potential opposition in in DeSantis uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Governor Abbott. And so on and so forth. But here's the problem for the Republicans. Both, you'll notice that what this scenario has done is it is a crossing of the Rubicon, as you suggested. But what that means is both sides now have to deliver. Mm -hmm. Even even the commentary I've been hearing from from uh, the Comicrat leaders, Cuomo and people like this, they're saying all of this. To get archives, mm. you'd better be delivering more than that. So they jump now, ship immediately. They jump ship immediately. So in other words, you have to deliver on something about this, and that that raises the speculation I I just mentioned about the possibility of manufacturing evidence, because if you're there for nine hours, you're not finding anything. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is you're probably planting bugs, uh, you're, you're manufacturing evidence. There's no telling what could be done. And here's the other thing. There's no representative of the Trump family apparently there as all of this searching is going on. Right. They wouldn't allow his lawyer in. Bingo. Yeah. That that's is, problem. I mean, that, that's, tell me anything that they find would be uh, 
uh, usable in any sane court of law. Now, yeah. again, we have a we have a government that's out of control, is not abiding by any sense of propriety of law. Uh, you know, forget about the Constitution. That that's a dead letter, folks. Right. Um, there's there's not even a sense of propriety anymore. So any anything that they find there is is in in my opinion a suspect immediately, or that they claim that they found. Uh, I'm not going to buy it. You're going to have to have absolutely irrefutable proof, and I'm probably going to be able to figure out a thousand ways from Sunday uh, what your what the problems are with your irrefutable proof. They just shot themselves in the leg. But here's the other problem. Not only are the commiecrats going to have to deliver, so are the republicans, mm -hmm. because they're promising now all of these investigations into these people and folks. If they think that that is going to be satisfied by the old Republic thug tactic, or oh, we're going to have investigations and hearings, by golly, if they think that simply holding hearings is going to resolve this for most people's minds, I got another thing coming for you, Mr. McConnell. It ain't going to, and that goes for you too, Mr. McCarthy. It ain't going to wash. You better not only have hearings, you better have prosecutions. Yeah. And they better stick, and they better make these people pay to the full extent of the law. Otherwise, it's over. So, in other words, did did this cross the Rubicon? Yes. But the question I have is, who's crossing the Rubicon here? The Commiecrats or the Republicans? Yeah. It, you know, there's no way this scenario makes any sense to me. Now, I, I as as I warned you, I'm I'm livid. Mm -hmm. I, I am really livid. I and, don't blame you. And, you know, imagine how this is playing out right now in Paris, Berlin, Rome, exactly. Moscow, Beijing. Exactly. What are foreign countries thinking of this banana republic? That's what they're thinking. We've become uh, a banana republic. Well, yeah, with nukes. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, <laughs> by the way, who controls those right now? <laughs> yeah, right. That's a good question. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Is it is it that insane, demented criminal grifter, the alleged president, or is it some secret committee headed by Nancy Pelosi? Right. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're out there. You know, they're out there painting their rainbow flags and being woke. You know, I, it's just it's hopefully not, it's not Anthony Blinken. That's for sure. Oh yes, hopefully it's not Anthony <laughs> Blinken. But anyway, it's just anyway. It, this situation is really bad. I mean, there's no two ways of. If, listen, Xi Jinping, if you really want to invade Taiwan and go through all that fuss and muss, now's the time. Yeah, right. Now, I doubt very much that Xi wants to physically invade Taiwan. That would be a nightmare. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, particularly if the Taiwanese decide, oh, we're going to blow up the Three Gorges Dam. Thank you very much. Yeah, but, <laughs> that's the um, end. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, no, this this is just insanity. All right. So I've been noticing today, you know, I'm trying to like you to, to stay on top of this, just to, just to see how people are reacting. Yes. My, my sense is people are reacting and that I'm on the mild end of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> because what I'm hearing people calling in on the talk shows <laughs> <laughs> they're not they're not missing words, Daniel. You hear you hear the little beeps out. You know that that the networks are trying to cover up the language here. Uh, it, it's pretty bad. I've got the bleep button right here. Yeah, yeah. Well, have it ready, Daniel, <laughs> because you never know what I might slip out with. But anyway, um, what I'm also hearing is. Already, there's a Florida state legislator saying that we need a law on the books right now mm -hmm. of uh, ordering state agencies not to cooperate with any federal searches like this. Absolutely. You know, and OK, if, if what that means is you've just fired the federal government. Mm hmm. You just said, take a hike, bye, we're gone. We're not, we're not, and, and that needs to be done. I'm not saying that it doesn't. It needs to be done. And Missouri has already done, uh, passed certain laws like that already. I have a feeling that's going to spread. Mm -hmm. And it's that means, 
this is uh, a complete violation of posse totally. comitatus. It's it, totally, as far as I'm concerned, yes. Uh, this is this is federal government overreach, and as far as I'm concerned, the federal government needs to be hired. Mm -hmm. If if the state that I'm living in would support a bill of secession, I would be all for it. At, at this juncture, I'm done. I am done trying to make this hideous system that the Philadelphia Convention gave us work. Mm -hmm. This is more proof, as far as I'm concerned, that my anti-federalist inclinations have been right all along. <laughs> all right, now, here's, here's a scenario that a friend of mine mentioned to me, I mean literally about three minutes before you sent me the link for the show. And I says, oh, I've got to mention that. And, and I'll credit my friend. The initials are KM. So my uh, this is not my scenario. This is my friend's scenario. Well, my friend told me that what if what they're looking for is that Putin data drop that Mr. Putin gave Mr. Trump? Right. You know, remember that that whole thing was kept kind of quiet and personal. Mm -hmm. um, and if Mr. Putin did give him anything of that nature, I would rather imagine that it has been kept extraordinarily quiet. Now, uh, that is about the only thing that I can think of that would make sense out of the extraordinary overreach that we've just seen. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, yes. it, it is. It it does rationalize it rather well. Otherwise, you know. Otherwise, I'm in rare agreement with uh, Congressman McCarthy that you know merit clear your calendar and keep your documents. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're coming because for you. Um, we're coming for you, and you better be coming for him, Mr. McCarthy, and getting ready to throw his ass in jail. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole point of it, which is when you use an arm of the federal government like that, that goes way beyond Watergate. That's oh, totally. Point. Yeah. I mean, using the FBI to raid your enemy? Yeah. It's ridiculous. During an election year. Exactly. After creating the wonderful optics of just hiring 87,000 new IRS <laughs> agents. Who now, can okay. even think of giving, in this environment, inflationary environment, $80 billion to the IRS? The Democrats. Incredible. That's who. Uh, I, I'm done. I'm done, folks, being bipartisan. This party has been, as I've been trying to warn everybody, has been corrupt from the get go. They're revealing themselves for what they've always been. Case ended. I don't do bipartisanship. I don't do negotiations. They are the enemy. Mm -hmm. They are the danger. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and mom, dad, I know you're Democrats, but you know, too bad. Uh, this is what the, <laughs> this is what the party. That was a different become. era of Democrats. That was a totally different era. Yeah, it's before uh, the war know. party neocons got in charge. Yeah, you know, Kennedy wouldn't recognize this. Oh, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, the way I'm reading uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., I don't think he recognizes it. Either. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like my God, Andrew Yang condemned it for heaven's sake. Yeah, exactly. When you got Democrats like Yang deciding to start their own party, you know, <laughs> you know something is very wrong. Uh, it, it's just you know, it, it's this. Let's just put it this way: this is not the Democratic Party of Senator Wayne Morris. <laughs> right. Know? Yeah. If you if you remember that old guy, I yeah, do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it. it, it you know, it, it's just nuts. It's, I, I can't figure this out. This whole thing is so over the top. And it, it has a quality of theater to it that, that I can't get rid of that is very disturbing to me. There's more here than meets the eye. The well, the only, Democrats used to believe in civil liberties. I mean, yeah, they used to. Far more than the Republicans, in fact. Oh, way thing. more than the Republicans. <laughs> yeah. As I remember, it was the Republicans that thought, oh, hey, it's a wonderful thing the FBI is spying on Martin Luther King. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. uh, and hey, so, COINTELPRO, that's a good idea. You know, we need more of that. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Jeez. But Joseph, when you look at the steps leading up to it, yeah. um, there were a few weird uh, outliers and handwriting on the wall. For example, mm -hmm. the Strange Jones trial. Mm hmm and, you know, the Sandy Hook, let's get Jones for 50 million bucks trial. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then this, the unusual fact that came out during the trial that Jones's legal team had sent two years of text messages to the opposition by yeah. accident. Yeah. And then immediately Liz Cheney and the J6 committee wanted to gobble that text messages up as if give us that intel as part of a deal or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then immediately, boom, after that, we have this unusual timing with the raid and also the fact that the timing takes place mm -hmm. during uh, the 48th anniversary to the day of when Nixon resigned. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you view that? Like what's going on there? There's, there's As I said, there's an element of theater to all of this. I right. find very disturbing. Yes. In other words, in other words, they're timing this as, as, as they do so often to coincide with significant dates mm -hmm. and with other, with other things going on. And that's what makes me highly suspicious about this whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, who does, who does this really ultimately benefit? Well, as far as I can tell from what's known now, the person benefiting the most from this is Donald Trump. Yes. Oddly it's, enough. It's not Joe Biden. Right. You know, if, if, if that if that nutcase is behind this, he just shot himself in the foot big time. No question. And and you know if if this is a deep state action, they just shot themselves in the foot. But you know this is why this whole thing makes no sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, if if there's any if there's anything in recent history that indicates that maybe Mr. Trump is playing five D chess. This might be it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. This might be it. Yeah, I completely agree. It's such an unusual move because it's so obviously flagrantly violating the Constitution. Totally. Yeah. It's it's violating any. It's worse than that, Daniel. I I don't. That Philadelphia piece of paper has not worked. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest with ourselves. The anti-federalists pointed this out at the time and said this is going to lead to oligarchy and plutocracy, and bang, not even a hundred years we're embroiled in a civil war, and Abe Lincoln is rounding up his political opponents and throwing them in the, in the clinker because they disagree with him, and no one is standing up to him. We got a weird thread of this. Is Woodrow Wilson did the same thing. Woodrow Wilson did the same thing during World War I. Uh, so, Reagan, Reagan had the Rex 84 plan yep. to round up the dissident yep. of war. Yep. And the McCarran committee in the 19, you know, all of it. it mm -hmm. It's it's nothing new. We better yeah. get it through our heads that this is nothing new, folks. What is upsetting to me is is less the flagrant violation of, of constitutionality and more the flagrant violation of any idea of the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. In other words, there there is a kind of um, a philosophy of law that that has prevailed in Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence for at least a millennium, and this flies in the face of everything that I've ever studied about that. Um, there there's no common sense here to what mm -hmm. they've done, and this is why I find it so disturbing. This this behavior is is more proper to the Soviet Ministry of Justice. Right. You know, this is the kind of, you know, Lavrenti Beria, Stalin's hatchet man, said, uh, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. In other words, right. we've, got, we've got the crime to fit the person. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is very Soviet-style tactic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Noam Chomsky, of all people. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. He came out and he said, uh, in relation to the Ukraine-Russia situation, that the United States was now worse and more repressive than the Soviet Union was in the 1980s, because in the 1980s in the Soviet Union, you could get the BBC and mm -hmm. differing points of view about what was going on. Right. Well, you're blocking Russian media over right. here from hearing the details about what's going on there. Um, it's interesting to me from all these different spectrums, everyone's looking at this thing and saying, what the hell is happening to this country? Well, the country has the country and its institutions have been taken over by a group of, of radical culturalist Marxists, cultural Marxists that, right. you know, that that's, that's it in a nutshell. And for whatever 
for better or worse, they've decided to hide out and, and hijack the Democrat Party. Um, and, you know, if you, if the Republic thugs think that they're going to play the system and, and the standard bipartisan game and, and expect things to continue as normal, they ain't going to happen. These are Bolsheviks. Mm-hmm. And they play for keeps, you know. They they don't they don't monkey around. Um, that's the problem, and the biggest problem is is for me, I think, is the geopolitical one. You cannot tell me that the effect of of what has been happening in this country almost literally since nine eleven. To me that's the bellwether. That's that's, you know, Bush the stupid taking the country and throwing the freedoms of yes. uh, you know, uh down the drain. Absolutely. Um it, it hasn't taken long for us to get from the Patriot Act and all of that nonsense to here. Um and again, please note folks, it was the Bush fam family. Yes. That led that charge. And it's interesting that it's the Cheneys that are so hardcore in getting Trump, right? Yeah, including Dick Cheney doing a commercial saying the biggest threat to the republic is Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, this is extraordinary. Well, Mr. Firebomb Iraq. Yeah, Dick Cheney just said the biggest threat to the republic is the the American people. That's what he really just said. Right, right. I'm sorry, Dick, but uh, your name is very apt. And, uh, you, you know, I used, I used to joke that, that Martin Borman was like Dick Cheney without the warmth and charm. Now I think I have to turn that around. Dick Cheney's like Martin Borman, but without the warmth <laughs> and charm. Um, and the mechanical ticker. That's and the mechanic, the fifth yeah. one or six, who knows what we're on. <laughs> <laughs> How symbolic can you get there? Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, he's, he's like Tin Man. He doesn't have a heart. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting, though, that portion of the establishment Republicans still in a death grip to get Trump out of the picture, even after they removed him from office, tried to impeach him, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever it is in that battle with Trump, it upsets the plans of the deep state to such mm-hmm. a degree that they have to come out bare fangs and all. Mm-hmm. No cover, you know. Here's raids. Here's Merrick Garland. Here's insane Biden, and they have to make sure that they stop Trump. Why? My guess, and and you know where I'm going to go with this, but my guess is it has to do with Roy Cohn. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Because they they showed the same kind of knives out for Joe McCarthy. Right. And come to find out that there was a lot more going on there uh, than met the eye. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, once you actually read the transcripts and not what Ed Murrow is telling you on CBS specials to think about the guy, um, (laughs) there was a lot more going on. And I strongly suspect that it's related to things that are very old that, that were close to being uncovered during that committee era in the 1950s. And to this day, Daniel, we don't know exactly what Roy Cohn told Donald Trump or vice versa. Exactly. But if ever there was a swamp, you pointed this out many times, and I've been borrowing it ever since, Roy Cohn was the original swamp creature. <laughs> yes, you no know, question he, about it. Yeah, and no, there's no... <laughs> I just read <laughs> about the guy... I mean, you talk about a sleaze bag, a worm crawling through every sewer that he could. Um, that was Roy Cohn. He knew the blueprint for the deep state. Yeah, he knew it. He, yeah, if anyone did, he would. He would have. Um, you know, friends with friends with J. Edgar Hoover and in, in the uh, pristine, uncorrupt, and and totally above board FBI. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. Yeah, if anybody if anybody knew things, it was Roy Cohn. So who knows what Trump and as you've pointed out many times, Trump's uncle at MIT is another is another weird connection. Trump, in other words, Trump comes into office. I go back to what I said in, in the original 2016 election. He comes into office as a deep state candidate. Mm-hmm. But he's just a different faction of it. Right. And, you know, what we're also seeing, it's interesting to me, uh, Daniel, that um, 
in the commentary that I've been seeing and listening to on the news since this went down, there's more and more people writing about that, that this is the factional infighting of the end game manifesting itself. And uh -huh. neither, neither faction, none of those factions involved have the slightest concern for, for the American people. This, you're down to the final few chairs in, in the game of musical chairs. And that's what this is really about. Uh, and that could be, who knows? That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, how does the end play out? At this stage, I think it's very clear that the powers that be want to split this country. I don't think that at this point it's avoidable. Uh, we know the basic reasons why they would want, you know, Catherine Fitz has said it many times, that, you know, if the country splits, that enables the central banksters to walk away from all their obligations. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the assumption of that scenario is that they walk away and they, they still continue to get to do what they, they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure about that. I think we're fast approaching the time where we just say, okay, walk away. And they walk away and discover that they've got no power. Oh, right. You know, um, there's, there's nothing that says if, if the union splits apart that, that one part of that uh, former union has to let the central banksters back in. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the gamble. Do you think the United States is the biggest obstacle for the one world government team? The biggest, uh, no. I, th I think the biggest obstacle to the one world order government team right now is not just Russia, but the Orthodox Church. Interesting. And I'll tell you why. Yes. Orthodoxy is, is a, an unreconstructed Catholicism. In other words, if you look at the history of the early church, you find no, and, and I'm sorry if I upset Roman Catholics here, too bad. <laughs> you find no evidence of the papacy and its later claims. You certainly find evidence of bishops of Rome, mm -hmm. certainly. But you don't find them acting as if they have a universal and immediate jurisdiction or an infallibility by dint of their office. You don't find that. If, if that were the doctrine of the church from the earliest inception of the church, then that entire history of calling all of those church councils to doke out doctrinal problems was unnecessary. It could have been solved by an utterance from the Pope. Mm -hmm. You don't find that. In other words, the doctrine is a lie. Mm -hmm. In orthodoxy, what do you have? Well, you have the original Catholicism, but it's interesting that there is no central authority. Every nationality, basically within that that church has its own independent, uh, completely separate hierarchical jurisdiction. So in other words, the patriarch of Moscow is the head of the Russian church. He's not the head of the Romanian church. Right. That's the patriarch of Bucharest. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Duh. It, yeah. So in other words, you're, you're looking kind of at, at, um, uh, an Eastern version of the Anglican Communion. The Archbishop of Canterbury can't dictate to the American Episcopal Church what to do and say and how to do it. Mm -hmm. Can't do it. You know, his jurisdiction stops at the shores of Great Britain. That's that's it. Uh, so you're dealing with a non-centralized ecclesiastical structure. That is totally, on the basis of its principle, that is totally different than the type of structure and centralization that Mr. Globaloni is for. So you can't get the kind of centralization. Precisely. Like, yeah. yeah. You'd have There's, to smash that religious network. You, yes, you, you have precisely. Well, they had a series of unusual incidents relating to the popes leading mm -hmm. up to this era, including that strange, uh, the pope was in there for three months and he dies of poisoning. 
yeah. just, just before Pope John Paul. And then Paul gets in there and he's a major mover and a shaker with the Cold War. He seems so politically mm -hmm. oriented. Mm -hmm. And then we get these very strange Ratzinger and then uh, now mm -hmm. Francis, who is just mm -hmm. like this social snowflake kind mm -hmm. of pope and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, representing reassembling the Vatican Bank mm -hmm. <laughs> and these types of things. But we're in a weird stage with them mm -hmm. where they're not even really acting the way no. you would figure a religious leader would. No, they're not. And and again, this this it was a long time coming. Yeah. You know, uh, we Eastern Orthodox can can sit on our butts and say, "Well, we told you so." You know, <laughs> that, <laughs> right. this, yeah. this is this is what's going to happen. Um, the the change, the the radical change as far as I'm concerned, within the Roman Catholic Church, begins the moment that papal claims first begin to be articulated, and that's in the ninth century. And from that point on, you see an increasing secularization of, of the office of a bishop in the Roman Catholic Church. Let me give you an example. When a bishop is consecrated in the Orthodox Church, you have to have at least two, preferably three bishops consecrating a bishop to make sure that the lines of succession are transmitted. But the other thing that happens is a bishop reads the consecrating, the, the consecrand reads an oros or statement of the faith. And that statement of the faith has to be accepted by the other bishops before they proceed with the consecration. In other words, you're transmitting not merely an authority, you're transmitting the content of the faith. That's what the bishop is supposed to guard. Mm -hmm. It is the primary responsibility of his office to do that. Okay. They're less concerned that, that uh, the guy is holy or any of that stuff. You know, they're, they're more concerned. Does he know how to celebrate the liturgy and does he keep the faith? That's, that's the ultimate thing. Now, that used to be the norm in the Roman Catholic Church, but what you see happening in the early Middle Ages is that that definition of the faith, the oath of faith, is replaced with an oath fidelitum, an oath of fealty or fidelity to the Pope. Oh, yeah. And at that point, what happens to the office of a bishop is he becomes... A, a literally an ambassador or representative of the papal office rather than a figure in his own right representing the continuity of the faith. Interesting. Now that and, reminds me a lot of when Hitler takes over and he has bingo. the army. Yeah. Bingo. And they swear directly to serve to him. Adolf Hitler. Yes. Right, right. They they no longer serve the constitution of the Weimar Republic, they serve Adolf. That's Amazing. precisely the same thing. Precisely the same. It's quite thing. a trick. It's quite a trick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The only office that makes any, has, has any real uh, authority or credibility in the church is the papacy and everything else is simply the extension of that office. Well, it's a consolidation. It's a, con it's a centralization like you've never seen. And it is, I, I hasten to point out again, it is absolutely not the way that the ancient church was organized at all. <laughs> interesting. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, these structures are really interesting to me because when I see what's happening in the United States, it seems to me that Christians are under incredible attack. And, you know, I say that as somebody who's not, you know, wildly religious or anything like that, but it seems over and over again you know, they're getting after Christians for this, getting after Christians for that. You know, you can't mm -hmm. pray in schools. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't profess your faith. Take down the Ten Commandments from that courthouse. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a stripping away of spiritual understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if you're Mr. Globaloni or a secularist, you cannot have, number one, you cannot have any challenge to your authority. And that's right. always, that's always going to come from religion in one form or another. Mm -hmm. You know, remember, remember Archbishop Thomas of Beckett, you know, from the famous play. They wrote a play about the guy. Well, this guy, this guy turned uh, king, the king of England into knots. 
mm -hmm. simply because he objected to to some of the king's policies on religious grounds, and that was it. Wow! So we got to murder the guy. Yeah, there's 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 no doubt in my mind that that religion poses the biggest threat to Mr. Globaloni, and of those religions that pose the biggest threats to him, uh, any form of ancient Catholic patristic Christianity poses the biggest threat precisely because it's not a centralized structure. And that's why they're after Russia. And that's why they're after Russia. I've been saying it, Daniel, for years. And the West, the West does not and cannot understand orthodoxy or its civilizations. Why? Because the Western churches committed themselves via the papacy to formulations of theological doctrine that are erroneous. Mm. They are heresy. Absolutely fascinating. Wow. Well, when you look at the policies that are coming in through the transhumanism, for example, oh. uh, so you have to strip away your gender. You, know, yep. you have to give your kids to the state. They yep. have to learn about sex at five years old. Yep. You know. And God help you if you're a woman, because now you can you can go to women's sports events and you might be facing a man who, right. by the way, is going to be undressing and undressing in your <laughs> locker room. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, this is the interesting thing, because they what? built up the LGBT community for so uh -huh. many years, but now they're turning on them. They're like, oh, yes. no, you know, like forget it we have these actual trans people like move you guys aside you yeah know. yeah yeah it's 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 it, you know again it's it's a form of gnosticism and it always eats its own because because once you buy into the idea that you can merely by changing a a term or changing the language that you can change reality itself there's no end to the process and the process always ultimately collapses for the very simple reason that it issues in epistemological collapse right what it usually ends up doing is it usually ends up bringing back the traditional society that it has tried to replace with a vengeance think russia Right. The Bolsheviks tried all of this, Daniel. They did all of this. They tried all of this. And for 80 years, they kept trying it. And finally, it just collapses. Right. Because there's only so much perestroika and openness that you can tolerate in a system that's based on, on an unreality before the system collapses. So what do we find in Russia? We find a... Uh, certainly a democratic state, but it's an authoritarian democratic state. Yeah. That's very traditional and they ain't going to budge. Right. We've been down that road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can expect from all of this kind of transhumanist action, a big swing back. Into oh yeah. Almost an ultra conservative society. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it's going to happen here. And I'm actually worried about that. Yeah. The reason I'm worried is is theocracies have been tried too, and they don't work either. Yes. And we can see, we, you know, we had a theocracy, again, thank you, papacy, in the West, <laughs> and, and what did it do? Well, it ended up burning people because they had different opinions about it. Yes. That. You know, um, we've been down that road too. I'm worried that the pendulum swing could issue in, in a, another demagogue like a Mussolini or a Hitler. That's what oh, yeah. I'm worried about. No question. Um, we've seen the left demagogues. You know, we've been living with them for 20 or 30 years. Uh, if you think they're bad. <laughs> yeah, right. It could create this incredible pendulum swing. Yes. Um, yeah. I think that's a real danger. I absolutely Huge. Agree. Yeah. Huge. And then everything would have to go straight edge. And if you weren't for a particular moral thing, you'd be out. And God mm -hmm. help you if you're studying mm -hmm. something outside the orthodoxy. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But here's the interesting thing about that. I, I think that we're kind of, it's very interesting because it reminds me of 1984 very much where mm -hmm. they wake up and suddenly the enemy is Oceania when they were allies before. And they have to get rid of all the references to being allies with mm -hmm. them. Um, 
they will take anyone as an enemy. So right now they might be cozying up to these groups. So they would cozy up to minority groups. They would cozy mm -hmm. up to, uh, you know, say we support gay people, we support trans people. But those are the very people that they would turn on. As oh, soon in as a they, heartbeat. Yeah, absolutely. In a heartbeat. Um, you know, yeah, you're, you're so right. If you, if you think things are bad now, with, you know, with the trans people replacing the LGBT, you know, the alphabet soup. Yeah. Just wait. Yes. Just wait for that pendulum to start swinging back. It's going to make Cotton Mather and the Salem Witch Trials look like a kindergarten picnic. Absolutely. Terrifying. Yeah. It's a terrifying thought. Yeah. Um, and this will be this will be done, incidentally, by people who aren't genuinely orthodox in, in my sense of the word. Right. It'll be being done by conservative Christians. Right. Yeah. You know, the Bible believing Christians. Well, <laughs> okay. What Bible here, folks? Yeah, right. Well, I use the King James. Well, the King James, here's the bad news, is an Anglican translation. Interesting. And it has all of those other books in it, like, you know, the Book of Wisdom. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, go read that one for a head trip sometime. <laughs> You know, yeah. this is my fear, is that the pendulum swing back to tradition is going to be a pendulum swing back to um, Calvinist 16th century Geneva tradition. Oh, right. Well, it's just like the censorship, you know. Bingo. Yeah, there's no question about it. Now, the whole thing was, uh, I would say the one central thing about America when you got to a certain point is embracing the idea that information should be free and, you know, mm -hmm. we should be able to express things. And we went through, went through mm -hmm. this whole period and then to wake up in 2022 with mm -hmm. the major tech company saying, you can't say this, you, you can't, can't mention that. that guy's name. You know, uh -huh. you can't say that that election was fixed. You uh -huh. can't mention that this pharmaceutical is bad for you. You know, uh -huh. um, that's real control. That's real control. Yeah. That's real and control. I would say it's fundamentally against the human spirit, but particularly totally. after we've achieved it to a degree in America, you know, there's a whole freedom in the DNA to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, America, you can own your own gun. Uh, you know, you, you have the right for free speech. And so when you get to that point, you say, what's happening here with just stripping that away, the people in their DNA understand that there's mm -hmm. a violation that's taking mm -hmm. place. Yeah, I think that is what's going on. It's, it's, this is what I was trying to get at earlier with, with the abandonment of, of just the basic philosophy of law as it's developed right. within the Anglo-Saxon tradition. You know, we all sense at, at a much more visceral level than the details of the narrative themselves that this is not right. Mm -hmm. And it's that sense that I think is crucial here. This is where the Mr. Global Onis always blow it. Right. They always blow it because they've been trying to get rid of that sense within the human uh, soul, within the human conscience for millennia. And ultimately it can't be done. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they can try and drug it, poison it, beam electromagnetic radiation you know they've tried everything mm -hmm. and there's something that just avoids you know avoids any attempt to be controlled and this is this is the big mistake i think they just made i in yeah. other words i do think they've crossed the rubicon here that is it is the action yeah. of you know of actually moving with a federal agency yeah Bingo. Uh, raid their political enemies it that that is Stalinist. It know? is. Of course it is. And it just does not, I mean, it's against the legal system. It's against the entire framework. So um, now here's what's interesting. I We can say that it could also be a MacGuffin that they're even looking for something. Let's say that that's, okay. you know, for the moment, that's actually a MacGuffin. But let's pretend for a moment that he mm -hmm. has something in his possession that they want their hands on and that they're terrified that he has it. Uh, I'd like to go through the few scenarios of what that could be, because of course we were talking about Trump and we know that Trump knows a great deal about the UFO file. Right. right. We also know about the strange conversation with judge Napolitano where he said, I can't release those JFK records. If you knew what was in there, you wouldn't release them either. Right. But it doesn't mean he wouldn't take a copy. 
Right. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, as president, even on the last day, the last hour of his presidency, he can declassify it without telling anybody and right. take it with him. So it could right. be technically declassified by Trump, mm -hmm. whatever this thing is. But before I, you know, I those are the scenarios I think about immediately. What could it actually be that he has in his possession? Well, I, I think that your your scenario is very similar to my friend's scenario about the Putin data. Yes. Um, this is an awful lot of, and this is why I think these kinds of scenarios make sense. This is an awful lot of trouble to go to just because Trump forgot to drop off a couple of boxes at the <laughs> National Archives. I mean, yeah. come on. Trump isn't even packing his own house. Right. You know, this is being done by staff and they don't know what they, you know, they're looking at. They're just taking boxes and chucking them into the truck for crying right. out loud. Exactly. You know, this is this is what makes this whole thing from that point of view just so comical. So, yeah, there's a MacGuffin somewhere. What does it have to do with? I I suspect you could be looking at a scenario that it might be due to all of the above. Right. In other words, it might be Trump having kept copies or at least diary entries. You know, Trump doesn't strike me as the kind of guy that keeps a diary, but maybe he started, you know, jotting things down. That, oh, had a briefing on this today, and they told me such and such. Right. You know, remember Reagan's memoirs. Reagan let out a huge one. Yeah. And he said, "Oh yeah, I've just been briefed, and we have the." space launch capability of, of 300 persons. Right. We do. <laughs> that's that's more than our space shuttle fleet can lift. <laughs> that's pretty Reagan, too. To just that's pretty Reagan. Reagan. Unconsciously yeah. transparent. Yeah, unconsciously transparent. That's very Reagan. <laughs> he's, take, he's taking a page out of the Joe Biden you know, old age dementia playbook. But, <laughs> if there wasn't an alien threat. Yeah. Somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> somehow. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think the chances are very strong that you're looking at some possibility like that. Uh, portion of the UFO file that would be right up there mm -hmm. because it's clear they want to control that narrative. Yes. And they don't need loose cannons like Donald Trump out there with his own thoughts on the matter. No question, uh, no question about it. Uh, um, well, I go back to an unusual thing that happened January 4th, mm -hmm. 2021. Mm -hmm. So the election's over, but J6 hasn't taken place yet. Right. And there's a guy uh, who is online, a lot of conservative commentator, and he keeps getting these uh, people from the White House feeding him different things about what's going on. And mm -hmm. uh, batting, his batting average was pretty good. And the guy mm -hmm. is around a lot on podcasts. His name is Jack Persobic. And yeah, was... he, f he fed out a tweet and said, Trump is going to fire everyone, especially FBI director Ray. Mm -hmm. And then he said he also is going to reveal the UFO file and the JFK file. <laughs> <laughs> now that's january 4th it didn't happen obviously, obviously but not. you know is are is this in relation to that because he heard that that was going around the white house at the end if if that was going around there's your mcguffin i mean yeah and and i was just about to say well if i were trump and i had a mcguffin like ufos i'd make awful darn sure to to sort of um doubly ensure my future by oh by the way this is what really happened with the jfk thing here's some more here's some more data right. for you jfk people um if if that's the case let's let's go back to something that you've pointed out many times mm -hmm. and that is that there's an intimate connection you have to be blind not to see it there's an intimate connection between the UFO file and the Kennedy assassination. Yes. No, there's no two ways about this. So whatever group took power in this country during the 1963 coup d'etat that was the JFK assassination, that group is still running things. Exactly. 
And it has the most to lose by the exposure of those two things. Mm. And let's go a little bit further with this MacGuffin idea. What other country on earth would be in a position to know things about the JFK assassination and about the UFO phenomenon? Russia. Answer, Russia. Yeah, no question. You know, and I have to want, you know, what did Mr. Putin and Mr. Trump talk about when they were by themselves on Air Force One in Helsinki? Oh, and the CIA and the media were flipped out about they it. They were furious. I've never seen it. anything like it. Yeah. Well, the press corps was going to savagely attack them. If, you know. if you remember, <laughs> even the even the Russian press was exhibiting hysteria in a you know subdued Russian uh, unhysterical way. Yeah. You know the the president and Putin. You know they were clearly wondering what the, what in the name of sense was going on even over there. So you know who knows. Well, um, we've had this problem since jfk and khrushchev because yeah. jfk and khrushchev were like we just want to be alone with the translator and that's it yeah um and you've pointed out that putin speaks pretty good english yes that's a big deal because that means even you could cut the translator out uh-huh. you know who else spoke english who stalin oh that's fascinating there's a ding 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 for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And here's the here's here's something that people don't know about that. For the most part, Stalin never let on that he could understand it. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Huh. Never uh, never underestimate Uncle Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're upset with Gorby and Reagan sitting around talking about alien invasions. Uh huh. For sure. And. Getting rid of all their nuclear weapons. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the zero option. We're just going to yeah, get rid of nuclear let's weapons. Get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> How's that work exactly? Who knows? What are you going to do with Pakistan? Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that conversation. <laughs> Mr. President... <laughs> We can't do that because that'll mean France is the world's leading nuclear power. (laughs) We don't want that. (laughs) Joseph, you've talked about this before. um, And it, but what's interesting to me is how the nuclear thing is coming up in such cavalier ways uh, around the Ukraine, Russia situation. And they're just like, oh, there might be a nuclear exchange, you know, like, and they even put out a PSA, the Biden administration about going into this building and protecting yourself, you know, just again, <laughs> but wear a mask, you know, <laughs> you got <it>. exactly. <laughs> what's going on there. Why are they even raising the nuclear thing 40 years after we knew they could replace them with whatever they had? Well, I suspect quite honestly and i hate to say this i suspect they're preparing a narrative oh they're yeah. preparing a false flag and, and a friend the same friend that came up with the the uh putin data dump scenario for what's going on with this fbi raid also pointed this out to me and i i had watched the same um i think what is going on with that psa my friend pointed this out to me that that PSA was really more for defending yourself against a dirty bomb. Oh, and I, I had to think about that and I thought, Oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Oh, wow. Then a full up, you know, a full efficiency fission or fusion explosion. Um, it makes a lot more sense because here's the other problem. We're we're into the situation now with nuclear weapons that you can literally dial up the yield that you want from them. They're they're that sophisticated. Oh wow! And they are much smaller than people can imagine. You can make them very small now. Uh, so I'm I'm less afraid of the full up, you know, big hydrogen bombs that we were talking about back in the 60s 
than I am miniature nukes, dirty bombs, and things like that. Because I, I strongly suspect, like you, Daniel, that in terms of the strategic arsenals of at least the United States and Russia, probably China, probably France, that you're dealing with countries that really don't need nuclear weapons. Right. They, they, they've got the rods of God up there. And, you know, nuclear weapons are, are big, they're costly, they're unusable, you know, you have to deal with the fallout. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I suspect they're as obsolescent as the dodo bird. You would only use them in special tactical, and that's that's what I think the the government is really warning us about, is that the use of tactical nuclear weapons is much more likely than the big strategic ones that you know we think of from the Cold War. So a false flag scenario, and you know, heaven forbid it would go down like this, but they could release something like that in a major city and then say, oh, we think there's a Russia-Ukraine link right. and heighten the tension there and also gain a kind of emergency powers ability at home, which would kind of, you know, uh, fend off the fact that they only have 30% approval and can't really govern. Right, right. It would be it would be it would be the last desperation measure to declare an emergency to try and keep this uh, shattering union together. And even then, I don't think it would be su sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't I don't think that that kind of emergency is going to be believed for one thing by the vast majority of the population, and for another, they have a they have the problem that all explosions, you know, all explosions have explosives have these little taggets implanted in them so that you know exactly where the, where the explosive was made. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing actually is true of the plutonium and uranium in a nuclear weapon. You can more or less tell where that came from by its, you know, minute differences in chemical composition. Mm -hmm. So you'd literally, if, if they were to have a false flag and try to blame it on the Ukraine or, or Russia, they would have to, first of all, take the conventional explosive in the nuclear device and make sure it came from a Russian or Ukrainian source. Right. That could be difficult. And then on top of that, they would have to make awful dang sure that the chemical composition of the plutonium or the uranium was identifiable as a Russian or Ukrainian source. And that's much more difficult. Interesting. They, they've got a big, you know, and then they'd have to convince everybody that they were telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, or just say it and then not let any of the international press in, you know, just keep right. us ties with MSNBC. <laughs> you can picture that now. <laughs> or, or, or the view. <laughs> right. Rachel Maddow, oh, the Russians are nuking us. Yes, they are. Oh, <laughs> the sky is falling. <laughs> and we have John Brennan as our special guest today. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> 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 We've got to do a television show. <laughs> That's good. I'll give um, you a point for that one, Daniel. <laughs> oh boy. Unbelievable. Let's um let's take a look at this scenario mm -hmm. of uh Trump and the UFO thing just to round it out. Mm -hmm. Um because I, I do think that Space Force is underappreciated in terms of what it is and what it was built for. And also the fact that Trump was behind it and accomplished it when it seems like nobody else could, um, or they didn't want it out there. But mm -hmm. the idea that I can bring back the UFO file and the exotic technology wing back mm -hmm. under executive control. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been mm -hmm. a number of different ways where they've tried this. Certainly Reagan tried it with star Wars. Mm -hmm. um, and they may have scared him into doing that by saying, oh, there's big aliens that are refueling on Saturn and all that, mm -hmm. which could very well have been true. Mm -hmm. uh, but whatever it happens to be, Trump builds the Space Force and then the UFO uh, piece falls under that. Therefore, right. the president's in charge because he's the commander in chief. Bingo. I have charge over the UFO file again. Mm -hmm. Um, now we go and the Biden administration takes over. They kind of ignore the Space Force. 
but they're hot on the trail of anything to get Trump. So the J6 kangaroo committee, uh, mm -hmm. the primetime hearings, even though nobody watches, and the fact that they say we're coming back in the fall with this, even though they know uh, that, you know, it's going to like Liz Cheney is going to lose office and things of this nature. Um, so what's interesting to me when I look at that is there's a definite get Trump piece in all this. And the idea that he would know the key there in the deep state, they don't want him as a competitor for mm -hmm. sure, uh, especially as a result of his association with Roy Cohn. Mm -hmm. And Roy Cohn has a weird tie-in to ex advanced exotic technology, oh, yeah. which you've pointed out with the Torvid document. And the way that I look at that is I see too many crisscross things around Trump relating to this. So yeah. let's suppose then that the MacGuffin is that he took the UFO file reference there that the document references the ufo file shortly before he left office he had a strange interview with his son we started talking about roswell and how many very strange things happened there in roswell yes you know this kind of thing yes. um and then as soon as he did that uh and biden gets in office then suddenly you have obama's talking about oh yeah there's all kinds of uaps and, and stuff out there that we don't know and then clinton is like yeah there's a lot you know there's all kinds of uap and so they want to take it over as soon as he's raised it to a certain point mm -hmm. so could this be a chess match with the ultimate piece being played now the fbi raiding to try to get the ufo file back it could be and i'll tell you why i think that um I think I think the the UFO ET thing is sort of the last the last card that they have to play. Right. You know, I'm following Carol Rosen's idea. Here, yeah. The Rosen affidavit. It's the last thing. Interestingly enough. Yeah, interesting interestingly enough. And they have to be, here's, here's their problem. And this is why they're afraid of religion, by the way. Ultimately, this is why. Because with Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, those specific religions, you have religions that are not afraid of the idea of ET or other life forms because it's part of their traditional belief and has been for a very long time. Interesting. The only thing that those religions are going to tell you, however, is you've got good ones and bad ones. Mm -hmm. And how do you distinguish between the two? Now, there's right. really only one religion that answers that one thoroughly for you. And we mm -hmm. all know what it is. What they have to do, Daniel, is if they're going to play that card... This is, this is the conundrum that they've put themselves in because they, they were angling to play that card since the end of World War II. They knew they had to. Why? Because they had a UFO problem. Right. You know, and they couldn't explain it. So any, anything, anything that they can do to control the interpretation, in other words, to control the narrative of what they're dealing with, they're going to do. Interesting. I suspect very strongly that they are going to try to present ET, and you can argue both scenarios here, and they're perfectly capable of pulling either one out of their hat. But I suspect they're going to try to argue that ET is really bad, and we need to prepare to fight ET. Now, mm. they might decide to go with the ETs, our space brothers, and we need to listen and do whatever they tell us to do. To clean up the environment. Or to clean up the environment. <laughs> uh, get rid of all those statues of Mary. You know, get yeah. rid of, you know, <laughs> throw out your Quran, whatever it may be. Right. <laughs> you know, they're yeah. they're, they're going to do it. Uh, but I, I, at this stage, it looks to me like they're, they're, probably trying to prep the narrative that et is a big threat here's the problem all it takes is for the real thing to show up and, <laughs> yeah, and <right. laughs> throw the whole thing into a cocked hat you know uh no we didn't shoot you 
<laughs> we can if you want us to you know no no don't do that <laughs> no i i suspect that this is really if if your ufo mcguffin is the thing in play here daniel then they've got to have control of the narrative they cannot have other versions of the narrative out there this is why they were in such a hurry to shut down those secret space program conferences yes they could not afford an independent or critical narrative that was not under their control to be out there. Could not. Do no that. question. There's a problem there because you had history, science, right. finance. Right. Uh, and political, geopolitical uh, references all in that. It wasn't a yes. fantasy story about right. inner earth princesses and things. And you've <laughs> also set up, you know, if my, if my uh, speculation is true, you've also set up a gigantic financial infrastructure. Yes. To fund to fund secret research. Right. And so the and system of finance. Right. Yeah. Right. You you have to control the narrative because that system depends on that control. Is there any possibility that a guy like Trump knows the system well enough through Cone that he can tap into the secret system of finance and they're like, hey, you know, like this guy can tap in to our exotic technology pool and our secret money pool. You know, he needs that's, to that's a possibility. That's yeah. a possibility. Because there's um, a money factor with Trump. There's a money factor. This is what I find so very strange about those McCarthy committee transcripts that, that I ran into. Yes. Because it's very clear that they're talking about UFOs, and it's very clear that they're talking about some sort of system of finance that no one really wants anyone to talk about. Right. And you put these things on the record, yeah, they're on the record because the UFO field somehow missed <laughs> that the McCarthy hearings had a huge UFO had a component. huge UFO component. Yeah. yeah, Joe McCarthy. You know who who's going to make? You know, I didn't. <laughs> he he's the last one I would have thought. But when you stop and think about it. He's at the height of his power right during the 1952 UFO flat. You don't think Joe McCarthy with his, you know, steel trap of a memory is not going to know that there's something going on with all of that. Right. And that he doesn't know anything about that UFO. No, not a chance. Mm -hmm. Not a chance. Uh, Cone's, it, Cone's pretty young when he comes into Cone that. Cone is mall. extremely young. Yeah. And, you know, the, you've got the big UFO flap, and, and lo and behold, the first thing that he starts doing in the committee hearings on Monmouth is trying to poke around the UFO problem. And right. And poking very well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's some sort of, of connection to Trump to this whole thing. Would Trump have known about that secret system of finance? I suspect that given Trump's um, background, particularly in the kind of, of development that he did with casinos and real estate and resorts and so on and so forth, I suspect that all it would have taken for an individual like that to figure out something is going on is simply to be aware of certain details and put two and two together. In other words, what I'm say, suggesting here is no one needed to have told Trump about this. He could probably have just observed certain things and come to that conclusion himself. Now, on top of that, given the fact that he is in the businesses that he's in, casinos and real estate and resorts and golf clubs and so on and so forth, he would be in a unique position to see the money laundering going on in those fields i uh, add on top of that roy Cohn and his connections with mob and mafia and so on you've got the perfect candidate for someone who if he's not in on the secret system of finance he's certainly in a good position to guess that there is one right yes and there are those who know yep. that are in the loop and there are those who are just operate out. completely on the outside yeah and they may have a suspicion yes now trump trump is one of those individuals that i strongly suspect would would be likely to have a suspicion and would be one of those individuals 
given the fact that he had to have played that side of the fence in order to even to get Trump Tower built and you know to begin with. Oh yeah. Uh, he had to play that side of the fence. There's no two ways about it. Um, I strongly suspect that that he's one of these kinds of individuals that may have been able to weasel his way into that system to a certain degree to obtain what he wanted. So in other words, I'm suggesting he may have had dealings with it. And knowing him, he would have dealt with it to the extent that he had to without becoming completely compromised by it. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. He, if there if there is a deep state faction that's behind him, this is where it's coming from. I've I've always said this that that his his deep state faction backers are going to be coming from the mob and the casino business, right? Because they're the ones heavy hit the most heavily hit by Obamacare at the time. Yes, and, and he got rid of that Obamacare tax. Bingo. Yeah. yeah so that, that people had that extra four hundred dollars a month or whatever it was, and the casinos could thrive once. Bingo. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. He 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 always struck me as 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 being a deep state candidate. And if there's one faction I would suggest that it was behind him, that was it. And that faction in turn is going to have those connections. If my hidden finance uh, hypothesis is correct, and I think it is, then that fashion in turn is going to be involved at some point with that hidden system of finance. So put all of that together and you've got a Donald Trump that knows something about it. Mm. Fascinating. Joseph, remarkable information and insight. Stay right there and let's go deeper on the secret system of finance behind these elaborate political gestures in part two. Now, that will be available at darkjournalist.com this weekend. Of course, you can find all of Joseph's work at gizadestar.com. We'll be watching this story closely for you. Please join us Friday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern for the X series. See you soon.